Good morning. It's great to see you. Those that are here in the building, welcome. We're going to begin. Those that are joining us online, we want to welcome you. So glad you're here uh, watching from wherever. This is a day of encounter uh, with God. It's a day where He loves to come and uh, meet with us and just change our mindsets, <laughs> right? Loves to come and reveal Himself to us in new ways. So Father, we thank you for what you're already doing today. We just get on your page this morning, God. We get on your page this morning, God. We thank you that you're uh, alive, (laughs) that you're the life giver and that you come to give us life in abundance. And so we lean into that this morning, God. We open ourselves to you. Lord, you're the life giver. Lord, you're the incredible one that does incredibly and immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. So we thank you for the more than we could ask or imagine this morning. God, we love you. We lift our eyes to you. We lift our hearts to you. We lift, Lord, everything that uh, wants to shout louder than you. We come and uh, put our eyes on you, that you would have the final word over it all. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence. Church, let's just engage him. Let's lift our voices, lift our hearts, lift our hands. Connect with him again. He's here. He's here to be the difference maker. Amen.
Jesus, just like that. 
point to the price you pay when something says I'm not worthy I point to that empty grave just like Lazarus oh oh you brought me back to life no longer I to live but Christ and me I've been born again my heart is free I hope I it out.
of your truth, reality of your words, reality of your words, reality of his love.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, all of this is for you. All of this is for you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you. We love you, we adore you. There's no one like you, Jesus. Take our praise, Jesus. Take our worship. Let it be a sweet, sweet fragrance to you. Thank you, Father. As I was worshiping, I literally saw me take my heart out of my chest, and then I lifted it up to the Lord and just kissed it to him like. So if that is your heart, I feel like many of you feel like that. I'm asking you as a prophetic declaration, just grab your heart and kiss it to the Father. It's his. We give it all to you, Father. We pour our love and affection on you because you first loved us so I'm reading out of 1st John 3 look with wonder at the depth of the father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us he has called us and made us his very own beloved children the reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize him beloved we are God's children right now. However, it is not yet apparent what we will become. But we do know that when it is finally made visible, we will be just like him. For we will see him as he truly is. And all who focus their hope on him will always be purifying themselves just as Jesus is pure. Father, purify us. Purify us, Father. Remove anything that does not line up with your word. Remove anything that hinders us from knowing your fullness, Father, knowing who you truly are. We love you, Father. All this worship, all this love, all of this time, Father, we dedicated to you. This is all for you. This is all for you. Let it be pure. Let it be holy unto you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You're a good, good Father. Thank you, Father. I feel that there is a sweet, sweet spirit of his presence here right now that wants to just love on you. Come, Jesus. More, more, Father. Our spirits cry out, Abba, Abba, Daddy. Daddy, we love you.
Let his sweet presence just wash over you. Any cares and worries of the week, just hand them to him just like you handed him your heart. Lord, we lay all those places at your feet. We give them to you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Well, we want to continue this place of awe and reverence and just wonder over our Father with our tithes and offerings. Father, we give to you just a portion of what you can give to us, Lord. Just a portion of what you give to us, Father. There are four ways to give, and uh, you can text to give. There's some envelopes and um, drop boxes. You can also give online, and of course, our app. You have some uh, QR codes right behind your chairs. Woo! Worship was good because I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sweating up here, guys, so I know worship was amazing. It was so, so good. Papa, you're so, so good. Today, I give you my sweat and everything, just all of it. And you are good, and you're good. We just thank you. We thank you for the giving. We thank you for the giver, Father God. We ask that you would bless them, bless them both with abundance, Father. Thank you. Thank you that we could just, we, our mind can't even wrap itself around how good you are and how much you provide for us and, and all the places, Father. For those that are struggling financially, we ask a blessing, Lord. Blessing, Father God. Your word says, if you give, you will receive. So no giving is too small for you, Father. It's the attitude of the heart. So we thank you for that, Lord. Amen. So I have a couple of announcements. Do I look all wet? I feel like I'm like super wet. Like I just got out of the shower. <laughs> okay, guys. So uh, we are going to have a prayer and worship night. I forgot to welcome you guys. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I'm out of it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Welcome. We're so glad you're here, guys. Your family, we love you. Welcome to those watching us online. I'm sweating. I don't know if we can have worship like that again. Okay, so let's see. Um, so, announcements. Prayer and worship night is this Wednesday, March 1st at 7 p.m. So we get to continue this. And I don't have to speak, so that's perfect, because I could just sweat in my corner over there. All right, and then Art of Hearing God is March 9th through 11th, and it will be taught by John Thomas and team. So you don't want to miss that. You can uh, sign up for that on our website. And true story, this changed my life. This, there's some teachings in here that I have not heard anywhere, anywhere. And I've been to several churches, and I just was in awe. I'm just, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for God's revelation and just the things that, you know, John has taught just have been life-changing, so I really recommend that you take the class or take it online if you need more time, um, but it will just rock you. And also, uh, we are getting ready to do church lunch again. Yay! I know everybody missed that, so it's going to look different this year. Um, we are going to open the church a little longer on March 12th, I believe. That should be a Sunday, March 12th. And if you want to run out or if you want to bring your lunch, you can always use the uh, refrigerator over there or we will just leave the doors open so we can all come back, bring your lunch back, and we could just fellowship together. If we end up playing games, good. Whatever whatever happens, happens. And uh, we're going to just do that. And also we're going to start meeting at the park. So especially those with littles, they can run around while we fellowship. And uh, we will be announcing that on the app. So we do want you to be a part of our community. So you don't just have to have the app, but you have to be part of our community. So if you're not part of our private community, please come see me and I will gladly add you. Also, do you have a heart for babies? I know you do. Babies are so cute. We all have a heart for babies. So we have a need and these babies would love to have some volunteers come in who carry the heart of the father. I mean, their little spirits are so open to receiving, and it doesn't take a lot. It's, it's more than just changing a diaper. It's about just sharing what is inside of you with them, whether you can sing them a lullaby, whether you want to play a craft with them, just tell them about Jesus. I mean, it's so simple, guys. Jesus loves you, and that's all it takes. So if anyone feels a pull to help in that area, uh, please come see Donna after service. Um, we would really love for for you to, you know, step in and see what, you'll be blessed way more than the baby. I can guarantee you that. So we would love for you to volunteer in that area. All right, guys. 
So, I woke up this morning. Well, this is my own fault because I started with a testimony on Wednesday during Emotionally Healthy Relationships about, you know, when I was four years old and my mom gave me the beating of my life and it just changed, you know, it taught me something which was a lie to just behave, don't be seen, be quiet, stay in your place, stay in your lane, don't move. And uh, this morning I woke up because had, I've had two dreams, John. I've had two dreams back to back since that day. That point back to my childhood, like that time. And I'm like, oh, no, Lord, no. So this morning, you know, I had another dream today. So I woke up and I was like dreading it. I'm like, no, Lord, no. I'm like, what did I do wrong? What is it? Just tell me because I want to fix it and da-da-da-da-da. And he is so sweet. First of all, how many of you know that was not the Lord? That was not the Lord. He doesn't tell you what's wrong and what you need to fix. So I said to myself, wait, that doesn't sound like the Lord. And so fat, just like that, when I said, that doesn't sound like the Lord, I heard him say, I love and accept you just as you are, yet too much to let you stay as you are. Just sweetly, he said that to me, that he loves me just as I am. I don't have to perform. I don't have to fix it. I didn't disappoint daddy. He's not mad at me, which is what I was thinking in the morning. But again, that goes back to what I shared with, with you guys from being a little kid. Like, oh, someone's mad at me. I can't take it. And um, he's so sweet because then I got John's voice in my head that says, the father corrects those he loves. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, <laughs> okay, John. So um, he loves me. That was the whole point, guys. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. It's not that he's upset about what I'm, this lie I'm believing or, or that I might be performing out of. He just loves me. And that's just another proof. So I encourage you, if you feel like the Lord is highlighting some things, it's not because something's wrong with you. It's not because he wants you to fix it. He's just showing you that he loves you. He wants you to live in his full abundance. And then I saw a picture of the prodigal son, and I remembered how he was still far away, and the daddy went running towards him, right? And back in the day, back then, that was not what the father did that was like really humbling himself i think the word it was undignified to do that back then for a father to run for his child and uh i love that because i said wow lord you're you're willing to be undignified for me and run after me even though i'm believing this lie or whatever it is why and i should be able to be undignified for you so that was kind of like the dance this morning was, you know, I'm just going to be undignified for you because you're undignified for me. Because you, I'm never too far that you won't come get me. So um, he doesn't bring up past failures. He receives you. And um, there's sonship. My first thought was from an orphan spirit. The second thought when he talked to me was a daughter. And uh, I just want to encourage you guys. You guys are all sons and daughters. He loves you. And whatever he points out, he's faithful. He is going to complete the work, and he's going to gently rearrange our mindsets. Amen? Well, Jesus. It's a fun thought, isn't it? That just like... David got undignified out of his love and passion for God. But God shows himself to be undignified out of his love and passion for us. That's astounding. We're, we're starting a series on worship, so it kind of led right into that. Um, and I have a lot of things that I want to say, but I'm going to keep to some things for today. But when we think about worship, an overarching theme, we're going to come back to a few different times, is this, the, the recognition that we love because he first loved us. That worship isn't merely a duty. It, it mis isn't merely an activity to earn something, to look like something, to placate someone. It's actually a response of the heart to the love that he gave us. And if we can hold that central, I mean, if that, that one thing, that one truth would be enough to, to teach a lifestyle of worship. Uh, 
I want to talk about worship a little bit. Um, well, for a lot of reasons. One, it's actually core to what it means to be a, a Christian, a believer. We were created to worship something. And everybody worships something. They just get to choose whether they're worshiping money or fame or their intellect or whatever it may be. Absolutely everybody is worshiping. The only question is what they're worshiping. And that is the reorientation of the Christian life it is so that our life becomes worshiping him, not other things. You shall have no other gods in front of me or besides me and in opposition to me that he is the object of worship. And discipleship is constantly bringing our hearts back to that place where that is the core. That is who we are. That is what we're doing. If you want, turn, turn with me to Matthew chapter 22 because there's a, a core understanding to this that I, I want to pull out of this passage. Uh, uh, a very common passage talking about the greatest commandment. We're gonna be, we'll start in verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, you have the Mosaic law that, that this person is talking about where God had called the people out of Egypt so that they could worship him. They get to the mountain, he shows up on the mountain and then he explains, this is what a life of worship looks like. And it was a complete reorientation of everything about their life. And so when you're asking what's the greatest commandment, you're asking what is the thing that I can do for someone that understands the law? What is the thing that I can do that's gonna most show my devotion and love for this God that I say that I worship? Teacher, what, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The, the whole point of everything related to the law, according to God, is, is orienting our lives all of our lives, everything that we think, everything that we feel, everything that we desire, the, the activity of our inner life and the activity of our bodies around loving God. That the greatest commandment is a life of worship. And that understanding must be a bedrock for anything that we call Christianity or else it ends up being something other than what God intended. Because as soon as Christianity becomes about anything, the worship of any God becomes about anything other than affection for our God, we end up in weird places. When it becomes about power, we end up manipulating, abusing, and destroying those that aren't like us. When it becomes selfish, we end up judging and separating and calling ourselves great rather than recognizing his greatness. Anything other than love for God and, and that being not, not just the goal but the engine that gets us there it is going to take us into a place that we should not go. So what is worship? The basic definition of, of worship if you look in a dictionary it's an expression of love. Now, we'll often say something like we have our worship service on Sundays. This understanding that all that we do is, is worship in the service, which, which is, there, there's, there's something that's accurate to that. But we talk about worship songs and we think of worship as a type of music. You can find that category on your iTunes, <laughs> right? It, it's, a, it's a type of but that is not worship. That is an expression of worship. 
Worship itself is merely an expression of love. It, it comes from an English word to mean the worth-ship, the scope of worth that we give to the object. How, how much is it worth? It, it, it comes out of this idea of value. How much value do we give? And so our worth-ship, our worship is giving our worth what we think that the object is worth. The English word for praise also comes from a Latin that means price or value. It's this idea that, that worship has to do with giving value to someone. Now, we're talking about God. You can worship all kinds of things, but what are we giving value to? And that becomes the test of worship. That what we give value to is him above anything else. And so we can find out if our heart is a heart of worship by comparing the value that we give to him versus anything else in our life. The passage Jesus quotes here in Matthew 22 comes from the Torah in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. It's interesting because there, there's, there's different texts and, and Jesus, well, actually, he he's sometimes would, would quote from different texts in the Old Testament, the Septuagint or the Masoretic, so the Hebrew or the Greek. In, in the Hebrew, it says that we worship with our heart, our soul, and our strength. Like most of your translations, you go to Deuteronomy, talks about strength and the concept that, that it actually is about the activity of our bodies not just the uh, not just the activity of the heart not just an activity of our emotions that, that every part of our being the whole heart the whole mind every part of our being is involved in this activity of worship you look at just the the word for worship in the hebrew and the greek it has a they're, they're both very similar it's this idea of bowing down now there's multiple words but the the most common word that, that's used for worship it's this idea of of bowing down to do obeisance to surrender and, and it's a recognition that that what you're bowing down to is bigger is more powerful than you it, it's so it's an act of humility it's an act of surrender uh, the Greek uh, includes this, this idea of bowing down to kiss. So there's an affection that's in there. It, it's not merely bowing down because I'm gonna get beat up if I don't, but it's out of affection, out, out, out of the movement of the heart that I willingly surrender, that I willingly look to him as greater, as more important, giving him more value than I give myself. So worship, when we look at it this way, is more than just music or songs. It's not less than. It must include that, but it's more than that. It's an acknowledgement of God's superiority over us, that, that he is bigger, that he, he's actually worthy. He, he has more value than we do in our own eyes. So we lift him up and we bow down. Worship includes surrendering to his will. If we're going to bow down, we're, we're saying that your will is more important than my will. The, the activity of Jesus in the garden when he says, I, I don't want to do this. Is there any way that this cup can pass from me, but not what I will, your will? That is the ultimate service of worship. That we surrender our mind, our will, and our heart completely bent to his intention and his will. Actually, we haven't bowed if we refuse to obey. If there's not actually a surrender, then there's not actually worship. That it actually doesn't have a reality in it. This is the, the point of 1 Samuel chapter 15. In 1 Samuel, Saul is king. 
Oops, I went to chapter 10. That's not going to work. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and I'm going to be in verses 22 and 23. God had given Saul a commandment. Go do this. And he doesn't do it. And we find out a little bit later in the story, when you, when you read carefully, the reason he didn't do it is because he wanted to make other people happy. And we will find throughout this series the number one thing that kills worship is the fear of man. You cannot fear man and fear God at the same time. Whenever you're concerned about what people think, you will not worship fully because you're giving them more value than you are God. You're giving their concern more value than you are his concern. You're, you're putting their feelings above his feelings. The, that, that fight is the major fight when it comes to worship. Saul did not win that fight. In 1 Samuel 15, when Samuel comes and confronts him, he, he says it this way, starting in verse 22. Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So that this, this recognition that our obedience to him is worship. Our surrendering what we want to hit to what he wants is at the core of what it means to worship God. A constant theme when you go through the prophets is this understanding of false worship, people doing an action without their heart being in it. So it's not worship when you're, fine, I'm gonna do it. That, that's not worship. It, it, it's when we move our hearts to come under. I, I, I'm, it costs me something to not do what I want to do, but you're worth it. And we're gonna find that cost is another element of worship. So it's a surrendering to his will. Service is considered worship. Serving him, serving God, is considered worship. One, one, of the, one of the senses of one of the words for worship in the Hebrew is to choose slavery. That, that's actually the sense of the word that you're choosing to become a slave of the other, that that is worship. And this kind of ties in, because we, we, we throw around the word ministry a, a lot, and that word ministry comes out of Greek word to minister, which means to do the work that a servant does, to, to, to do the work of a slave. The idea of, of someone who is a worshiper, who is a minister, is someone who has made themselves a slave to God. Now, that's the biblical meaning. It's not always a cultural meaning. That is the biblical meaning of, of what it means. And, and, and our service, whether, whatever that looks like, what we do in response to him, serving him, again, this is a surrendering of our will. So as we surrender our will, that's worship. As we serve him, that is worship. Devotion and prayer is considered worship. Worship. The things that we do, our devotional life. Take a look at Acts chapter two. And this is, did I write this down wrong? I did. That's supposed to be Luke chapter two. Luke wrote Acts but it's not called, yeah, Luke chapter two. That's much better. Verse 36 and 38. Now that's not the right one either. Acts 
Well, the passage that I was looking for is the passage where it talks about Anna being in the temple. Oh, and I'm in chapter three, no wonder. That's gonna hurt. It is Acts chapter two, instead of Acts chapter three. Yeah, Acts, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter two. <laughs> Boy, I'm really confused, can you tell this? <laughs> Luke two, 36 through 38. I know what it's supposed to say, just when I was looking at my, it's like, that's not what it was supposed to say, okay. 36 through 38, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. Her fasting and prayer was her worship. That life of worship, that, that devotion that she had completely reoriented her life around God, surrender, absolute surrender in, in, in essential things, her time and her hunger. Now, if you've fasted for, well, usually it's when you first get really hungry at six or eight hours, that, that, that start, you start to feel it. And then the second day and the third day where you're, you're just struggling. There's cost to fasting. Now after three or four days, then it kind of gets easy until somewhere between 14 and 25 days. And then it gets hard again. And then it's a real cost to fast. Imagine spending 84 of your years of your life in prayer and fasting. Simply because you love God. You just want to be with him. Whatever, whatever it takes. Not out of, I'm trying to earn something. But out of, I, I, I'm so caught up with this God that I'm going to ignore what I'm feeling right now so I can spend time with this God. Not out of trying to manipulate God. She wasn't trying to get something. She was expressing her love. It's worship. I already mentioned that worship includes sacrifice. We, we talked about the, the Israelites coming out of Egypt. When, when Moses went to Pharaoh and told him, hey, let my people go free, this is what God says, because they need to go worship me. Well, what do you need to worship? Well, all of us need to go with all of our animals, all of our flocks. Their worship was the sacrifice. So there, there's, there's a sacrifice that's involved. Now, when, when you understand how God intended that sacrifice, Almost all of the sacrificial offerings in the, under the Mosaic law, the offerer got to eat of. So your sacrifice doesn't mean that you get nothing out of it. There, he wants to share it with you. Some of it was for him. It got burnt up. He got to eat that part. You get to eat part. And then whoever the priest was that, that was doing the work they get paid for their wages. They get to eat part. And some of them, you were actually supposed to get other people, either the poor or the family or your family that would come and that would eat with you. So the sacrifice, there's a cost to it, but that cost is not that we go without. It's that we've set this aside for him, for his purposes. And I don't get to do whatever I want with it. I get to enjoy it the way he wants me to enjoy it. And out of that enjoyment, we find that our worship is fulfilling, not just emptying. If worship is only emptying, something's not being done right. There should be a filling that comes with it. It's a mutual thing. So the, the thing about worship is it's interactive. We're, we're actually with a real person that our worship is unto a real person. It, it, we're not worshiping a concept. 
We're, we're not doing something where the other person that is the object of our affections isn't actually there. That, that he's actually involved in the whole process. That there's, it's a relational thing. It, it's not just an activity that's not connected to this other. So that, that back and forth I, I mean, it's, you know, sometimes people get distracted and you tell somebody, you know, I, I love you, and they just ignore it. And distraction, that, that could be fine, but if you never have a response, you're gonna start to question if the other person cares about you. And you should. So in our worship of him, he responds back to us. We get undignified for him and he's willing to get undignified for us. He's so willing to get undignified for us that he hung naked and brutalized in front of the whole world to say how much he loves us. His devotion to us was exemplified in that. And it didn't end there. Because it's not like he only has so much devotion and he wasted it all at that one time and he's got nothing left. His love is continual. That there, it's, it's, that there's no end to it. And he's continually revealing and expressing that love back to us in our expression of love to him. And that leads us to the next part. Worship is more than activity. It's more than just, I'm surrendering my will, I'm gonna serve, I'm gonna do the right thing. It, it, it actually is a movement of the heart. Worshiping without the emotions being stirred is not worship. Now, are there times when you worship and your emotions are stirred? Yes. You, you do things that you don't want to do because they're the right thing to do. That's called maturity. Maturity right? That, that, that's not religion. That's called maturity. But in that place, if we never have an experience of our hearts being moved towards him, we must wonder if we've ex ever experienced his love coming to us. Because we love him because he first loved us. And so in, in that place, if we've not had that experience, the, the, the answer is not to do more and try to to, to fast more and, and whatever, sacrifice more and get more activity, more activity, it, it becomes at that point, I need to learn how to receive. Because your capacity to receive love is going to determine your capacity to give love. Simon, there, there were two people that owed their master one a little bit and the other a lot, and the master forgave them both. Which of those loved the master more. Remember this parable? The one who has forgiven much. The one who felt the love the most is going to express the love the most. That's the principle of worship. We're supposed to worship with all of our hearts, which means that we actually get involved when it becomes empty activity and our hearts are not moving, there's something going on and we need to figure out what's going on. We need to figure out what that root is and, and, and find that answer to that thing. Is there, you know, is there grief? Is there unforgiveness? Is, is there something, have we judged God? There's all kinds of things that, that may cause that. Sometimes it's just pain. We're, we're just, sometimes we're distracted. We're worried. In any of those things, we come back. What, what is it that's holding my heart? How can I bring my heart back into worship? And we begin to develop that. And if we develop a lifestyle of holding our heart in the place of affection for God, we will find it easier and easier to come back to that place. When it's a random thing that we do periodically, once in a while, it's, it's harder. 
to be able to get there. But if we maintain that sensitivity, if we're constantly bringing ourselves back to that place, and in that place we experience something differently. We don't always feel it, but if we never feel it, there's a problem. Does that make sense? Sometimes our emotions get stirred and it causes worship to explode out of us. Sometimes we start to worship and our emotions get stirred. And they're both good and they're both right. Whichever way our lives should be worship, what's the greatest, what's the most important, what's the weightiest commandment? Love God with everything you've got. You know, that, that concept, I love you, but I don't like you. Yeah. That's nice religious talk as an excuse for bitterness. We have commitment, and our feelings, yeah, sometimes they go up and down. There's There's movement. Well, the commitment stays 100%. But if we're not coming back to the place of feeling, then there's something wrong right here. Something, something isn't right here. And so it becomes a test that we find where we're at with God. Worship is attention. Setting our focus on him. It, it's adoring him. Uh, that word adore, I, I love history and, and the roots of words. So uh, adore, it actually comes out of a Latin word that means to pray. That, that word, that, that word we use, like I adore puppies, I adore whatever it is. Usually when we use that word, we're talking about that feeling of like, oh, yes, it just makes me feel good inside, Right? The root of that word was the devotional life of people of prayer that were worshiping God. That, that's where that word came from. That, that's what this is supposed to look like. It, it, we, we get our attention. He gets our attention and everything becomes about him. First Chronicles, and I actually wrote this one correctly. First Chronicles chapter 28 verse 9. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searches all hearts and understandings every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole focus, our whole attention, that, that our whole lives are oriented around that as the baseline of who we are. We are worshipers first, and everything else comes out of that. Everything else becomes an expression of that worship. That's why Paul could say, do your work as unto the Lord. That's an expression of worship. When you show up and you're doing whatever you're getting paid to do, that is worship. Do it out of reverence. Serve one another out of reverence to the Lord. When you're interacting with other believers, that interaction is an expression of worship. How you interact with other people tells you the worth that you give God and the worth that you give that person. It's worship. We seek, we serve with a whole heart, and when we do, we find him. It's in that place, he shows up again and again and again. If it's been a while since you felt the presence of God, spend more time in worship. True worship 
not just empty activity, but the movement of the heart and orienting your lives around him. Now, like I said, worship is not merely songs, but it most definitely includes songs. Go to Psalm 86. The Psalms are, is a whole book. The largest book of the Bible is a song book that the people of God used to worship him for millennia. Our whole life centers around worship. Psalm 86, I'm going I'm to read verses 8 through 13. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you've made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever, for great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. This complete orientation of our lives towards loving and worshiping him is important. Uh, David understood that, that, that this was essential. It, it was essential to a, a people that were going to be called by God. So he, he establishes within a, a nation an order of worship, and he set in place musicians to constantly play. He, he, had, he had thousands of musicians that showed up, and out of those thousands of musicians, he chose 288 that were skilled in their playing and in their singing and the, in their instruments that they would lead worship and put them on rotation so they would constantly be going at any given time. There was always worship was going on. For at least 33, it was 33, 34 years, there was this constant worship in this tent where it never stopped day or night. There, there was also worship. And, and every time the people of God came back to the place where God was gonna be the center of their lives, they came back to the order of worship that David set up. So some of the activities that get included in biblical worship, you have the idea of lifting up hands and bowing down. So Nehemiah chapter eight, verse six talks about that. So when, when we worship, there, there's lifting hands. Uh, if, you've never, if you've never seen it, well worth three minutes to watch just a short skit. Um, and as soon as I go to say that, I lose the guy name that does the whole thing on hand raises. Anybody seen that hand raises in worship? What's, what's his name? Tim, Tim Hawkins. Tim Hawkins. You got to watch that. So worth it. it. It'll help you. It'll help you in worship. Smiles usually do. Laughter is good. There talks about laughter in the Psalms. Psalm 33 says that we can worship with loud shouting. There's actually supposed to be some noise and some interaction when, when we worship. Now, it also says that we can worship with silence. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him says that we sit before him. It says that we stand before him. We kneel before him. We lay prostrate before him. All of those are, are worship. It talks about new songs. Uh, new songs, they, those might be spontaneous songs in the moment. But whenever there's a move of God that happens throughout history, so far revivals have been marked by songs being written that there's a new sound that expresses a response of a people to the, the nearness of God that, that says something. And so when, when we begin to worship, there, there's these moments of, of things being drawn out of the hearts of the people through the hearts of the worshiper. And so you'll, you've noticed at different times when, when Roland is leading or Veronica is leading or Ali is leading in worship, that there will be moments of going off the page. 
and it's just that expression, and it's not, it, that's not necessarily prophetic. It, it's, it's prophetic if it's somebody speaking for God. So if it's from God to the people, that's prophetic worship. But when it is, is the heart, the response of the heart, that's spontaneous worship. But that is, that is a, a valid form of worship. Psalm 149 says that dancing is normal in worship. All kinds of instruments. Psalm 150 and a bunch of other places. And prophecy. First Chronicles 25.1 says that when David appointed the Levites to play their instruments, it actually doesn't say that he appointed them to play their instruments in, in, in this passage. First Chronicles 25.1 says he had appointed them to prophesy with their instruments. So this was not about words. This was about sounds that were communications from God to the people. And there's a sound that gets released sometimes that awakens, it actually releases the atmosphere that's in heaven into the earth and we become more aware of the presence of heaven because of something that's carried on the sound. And we'll talk more about that. I don't follow that rabbit. I'm just putting a marker. We will follow that path another week. Because we're, we're going to be, it's going to take us a little bit to talk about worship. But I, I wanted to lay a foundation uh, of what, what is worship. It, it's a whole life oriented around God with wills submitted, minds focused, and hearts moved by this God that we worship that, that, that costs us something where we actually put his Desires and his feelings over our own. And it says in the Psalms that when we worship, that he gets seated on our worship, that, that our worship creates a throne that he sits down on in our midst. When you get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of worship. You go, just go to the book of Revelation and every time it shows the throne room, every time there is worship. People are singing, people are falling, they're, they're, they're throwing their crowns before him, they're acknowledging his greatness that we were created for worship because it's that place of our attention kept on him that allows us to be more aware of him, which everything flows out of that awareness. You, you can get spiritual power by just looking for spiritual power. There are witches and warlocks that have done that. But when you begin to focus on his presence, spiritual power is available. Whenever you gather together, these things must be done. The Spirit begins to move in your midst, and there's healings, there's miracles, there's words of knowledge, there's prophecy, there's faith, there's all of these things. They, they just start to happen. It, it, it's in that place of acknowledging that, that we hear him more clearly to the point where there were prophets that said, hey, go get a musician, and then I can prophesy. That it was in that place, that atmosphere, but the activity of worship without the heart of worship is the definition of hypocrisy. And if there's one thing that we get out of this whole series is that our lives are oriented around him. And that is a life of worship. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, Roland, do you mind maybe leading us in some worship? I think that would be a good response. Let's worship a little bit more. While he's finding that, I'm going to read this little spoken word thing. 
the fear of man will have no hold on me. My heart has been set free. Intimidation will not hold me down and fear will no longer drown my praise. I choose to let the fire of passion consume my inhibitions like the anointing melted the ropes on Samson's hands like wax. Their looks and their thoughts, what will they say or do, no longer has control of my worship, my actions, the path that I choose. Those that fear the Lord will be bold and I will walk free. No longer a slave, a marionette to popular opinion or the corporate they. The strings have been cut, the contract canceled, nailed to bloody wood and buried in a grave no longer to see the light of day. I am not theirs and they are not mine. I am his and he is mine. The eyes of my father are all I see. The heart of my Abba, my only concern. Traditions of man and expectations of religion are weakening and gasping for breath as the breath of God breathes in me and I see his glorious freedom for it is for freedom that I have been set free. I do not perform for praise or shrink from criticism. I live for one. I perform for one. I don't work for acceptance. I've been accepted. My value is not in question. My reputation is not a consideration. Love is the only control. The debt of worship to the Holy One, my only motivator, the fear of man has no hold on me.
within us to be given back to you. Lord, would you anoint us to love you well? Would you draw us back to that place where we are constantly remembering your presence, our lives oriented around you, you on our thoughts, you on our hearts, you in our desires, you, the center of it all, the goal of it all, the alpha, the omega, the originator and the finisher, Lord, you. We want to be a people of worship. We want to build a house of praise where you are comfortable. You are given first place. Lord, I'm asking that you would release grace upon this family that you're building to worship you well. Lord, we thank you for the invitation that you've given us to draw near to you, to seek you out, that you would draw near to us, that you would be found by us. We just say yes to your invitation. We say yes to your invitation. We will seek you. We will seek you.
Come, Lord. Come, Lord. We always want to have time for ministry. We bring the sacrifice, but we get to eat with him. He's always good in coming and meeting with us when we come to meet with him. So if there's anything that you want prayer for, um, how about we do this? If you're been released to pray, would you just stand up and we'll have people come to those that are standing to get prayer. That's you too, if you want to. Thank you, John. All right. Well, if you want prayer for anything, just come to one of these. So that, whether it's, it's a physical need, it's an emotional need, financial need, Maybe you just, you, you want something got stirred and you want to respond. You want God to touch your heart to, to release more worship. Come and come and get some ministry. Let, let's, let's pray for one another. We're going to finish up our service this way. For those of you that are online, we will see you next week. Bless you guys.